أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعين به ونتوكل عليه والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق وخاتم الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين حبيب إله العالمين سيدنا وحبيب قلوبنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المطهرين المكرمين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد قال الله العظيم في كتابه الكريم وهو أحسن القائلين وأصدق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم من يطع الله والرسول فأولئك مع الذين أنعم الله عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين وحسن أولئك رفيقا آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم for the purification of the souls the enlightenment of the hearts for the acceptance of the deeds and for the hastening of the reappearance of the awaited Savior عجل الله تعالى فرجه الشريف Enlighten your souls, purify your hearts, and the atmosphere with the recitation of salawat upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Respected elders, scholars, sisters and brothers, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi Ta'ala wa Barakatuh. Amina bint Wahab, Fatima bint Asad, Khadija bint Khuwailid, Fatima bint Muhammad, Shaharbanu bint Yazdajard, Fatima bint Al-Hasan, فاطمة بنت القاسم حبيبة ونجمة خاتون خيزران القبطية سوسن المغربية حديث النوبية and سيدة نرجس These are names of the mothers of the أهل البيت starting from the Holy Prophet of Islam all the way to the 12th Holy Imam, Imam Al-Mahdi salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'een. And there are indeed names that are unfortunately unfamiliar to many people today. When we recognize the love that exists in our hearts for the Holy Ahl al-Bayt, you and I would do anything for Ali Muhammad. You and I would dedicate our lives, would give whatever is necessary in order for us to attain their intercession, for us to be called the Shia in this world, and to be raised with them on the day of Qiyamah. This is in accordance with the teachings of the Holy Quran without a shadow of a doubt. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter 42 verse 23 tells you and I that the requirement for you and I is to demonstrate love and loyalty. قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى The recognition that emerges is that this love that you and I need to demonstrate, which is a cornerstone, center stage in Shia theology towards the Ahl al-Bayt, is one that you and I have been raised with throughout our lives. Imagine what we would do for the sixth Imam. Imagine what we would do for the eighth Imam. Imagine what we would do for each and every member of the Ahl al-Bayt. And imagine the happiness that they would obtain when we knew their mothers. The recognition that emerges today is history has been unfair and unjust towards the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt. In the idea 
that the followers of the Ahl al-Bayt, many of them would struggle to name or know anything about these illustrious individuals. Today, if you ask around the world, perhaps the first few mothers of the 14 are mentioned, are known. But the more we go towards the latter Imams, the more people struggle to even recognize these particular individuals. The Quran, however, has presented a different narrative. What do we mean? Please understand this. So that we can appreciate the importance of this subject. The Quran comes and praises the mother of each and every ma'soom. Yet, it does not praise the wife of each and every ma'soom. There is a difference. You think, what's the difference between a wife and a mother? The idea that emerges is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns two wives of ma'soomeen. Yet every single mother of a ma'soom mentioned in the Quran is praised. When we look at, for example, Nuh alayhi salam, Lut alayhi salam, their mothers, or their wives rather, are wives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a parable regarding the disbelievers. Yet when you examine the subject of the mothers of the ma'soomeen in the Holy Quran, what do you recognize? You will come with the conclusion that they have been praised, each and every one of them. You say to me, give me examples. You look at the mother of whom? The mother of, for example, you have Ishaq and the mother of Yaqub. This is by the name of Lady Sarah, the wife of whom? The wife of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us of the conversation between this lady and the malaika when she was informed of the fact that she will give birth at a later stage in her life. Allah says, وَامْرَأَتُهُ قَائِمَةً فَضَحِكَتْ فَبَشَّرْنَاهَا بِإِسْحَاقِ وَمِنْ وَرَاءِ إِسْحَاقِ يَعْقُوبِ That she was surprised. How will I be given a child? But Allah says, we gave her glad tidings. That's whom? That's Sarah. Similarly, you look at the mother of Maryam, سلام الله عليها. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says what? وَإِذْ قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ عِمْرَانِ رَبِّ إِنِّي نَذَرْتُ مَا فِي بَطْنِي مُحَرَّرًا The mother of Mary said that, Ya Allah, I dedicate what's in my womb to you. فَتَقَبَّلْهُ مِنِّي Accept this from me. Similarly, whom she was carrying also was a mother of Ma'soom. Maryam, the mother of Isa alayhi salam. Allah tabarak wa ta'ala praises her. وَإِذْ قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اصْطَفَاكِ وَطَحَّرَكِ وَاصْطَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ Allah tabarak wa ta'ala says that the malaika said, O oh Mary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has specifically chosen you, purified you, and chosen you over the people of your world. Who else do we find in the Quran that is praised, that is a mother of a ma'soom, the mother of Musa alayhi salam. She's also given this particular honor of being communicated to through intuition, ilham, by Allah tabarak wa ta'ala. وَأُوحَيْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمِّ مُوسَىٰ أَنْ أَرْضِعِي Allah says we gave the mother of Musa the instruction that you must suckle him. Yes? Likewise, today millions of people follow in the footsteps of a mother of another ma'asum. Who's that? Hajar, salamullahi alayha. When people go to Hajj, when they walk between Safa and Marwa, what do they do? They are emulating and following <coughs> the footsteps of this great lady, Hajar, salamullahi alayha, and her struggles, the mother of Prophet Ismail. Therefore, the recognition that emerges in the Holy Quran is that the mothers of these holy individuals are righteous, are to be praised, are individuals of notable character. The school of Ahl al-Bayt comes forward and says, the mothers of the Ma'sumin, the 14 Ma'sumin, have a higher status. <coughs> Please understand this, and you will recognize the importance of this subject. When we come to this area, what do we find? We find that the school of Ahl al-Bayt highlights that the mothers of the 14 Ma'sumin have to be known, 
have to be studied, have to be recognized, because this is part of mawadda of Ahl al-Bayt. This is part of showing love to Ali Muhammad. Imagine when you and I can describe the mother of Imam Ja'far ibn Muhammad and al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. <coughs> and this would place happiness in the heart of the six holy imam, wouldn't it? Yes, the study of the biography of the lives of these holy individuals, the 13 mothers of the Ma'sumin. How many? 13 mothers of the Ma'sumin is crucial for a number of reasons, is significant for a number of reasons. Why? Today, we have many who come out and say that there are not enough role models in Islamic history when it comes to females. There are those who say, why are all the prophets male? 124,000 of them are what? Are male. There are those who come forward and say, we have Sayyidatun Nisa, Fatima, we have Sayyida Zainab al-Kubra, we have Khadija al-Kubra. But when it comes to other role models, we struggle to name female leaders, individuals who changed the course of history, who had significant roles to play in society. And I tell you, it is the fault of us, in addition to the crimes committed throughout history to hide these personalities. There is a book today that is being translated to English. It's called A'lamun Nisa al Mu'minat, the names of the believers who are female. It has 400 biographies of female personalities in the history of Shia Islam. And the author says that when it came to these ladies, what? There are much more. But it is what? Information about them that I found and therefore I decided to include them in this book. For example, there are many of them who are unheard of today. One of them, her name is Habab al-Walibiyya. Who is Habab al-Walibiyya? Habab al-Walibiyya is an individual who is praised by the Holy Six Imam, Ja'far al-Sadiq salawatullahi wa salamu alayhi. He says, إِنَّ حَبَّابَةُ الْوَالِبِيَّةِ كَانَتْ إِمْرَأَةً شَدِيدَةُ الْإِجْتِهَادِ This lady was extensive in her struggle and hard work. I ask you, have you heard of Habbaba and who she is? Do you know anything about her? Have you heard of her achievements? This particular lady says that one day I went to the commander of the faithful, peace and blessings be upon him, Amir al muminin and I saw him next to Sharatatul Qamis, the Thursday police. There were several hundred who said they will fight and defend their lives for Amir al muminin She said, when I saw him, I said, Ya Ali, what is the sign that you are the imam chosen by Allah? Give me a sign. He says, Habbaba, Go and get me a pebble. This is found in a number of our narrations. She gets him a pebble. He what? He stamps on this pebble a authority, a seal of authority. And he says, only an imam chosen by Allah will be able to do this. She then, after Amir al muminin went to Imam al Hassan alayhi salam. He did the same thing. She went to Sayyid al-Shuhada. He did the same thing. She was 113 years of age when she met the fourth Imam, Zayn al-Abideen alayhi salam, and he did the same thing. She went to al-Baqir, she went to al-Sadiq, she went to al-Kadhim, she went to al-Ridha. Each and every one of them would stamp on the pebble. She met eight Imams of the Ahl al-Bayt. Can you imagine? The status of this lady was so tremendous, praised by Ali Muhammad, that she had the honor to meet eight of these glorious individuals, yes? And therefore, the study of the lives of these holy individuals, the Ahl al-Bayt's mothers, <coughs> is very important. Why? It raises the names and the lives of these people that are unknown to you and I. That's number one. Number two, it also deals with some contemporary issues and challenges that you and I deal with today. 
And the idea that today one of the challenges the world faces is racism, bigotry. And there are many who complain of the inequalities that exist, of the prejudices that even exist in the Western world. I tell you, how many knew that from the seventh Imam onwards, all the mothers of the Imams السلام, were from Africa and all of them were dark in complexion. And all of them were slaves. The Ahl al-Bayt could have chosen from Arabia, yes. The Ahl al-Bayt could have chosen relatives. But the fact that the mother of Imam Musa al kadhim yes, going on towards the 12th holy Imam, as we will show, are all slaves from North Africa, highlights a systematic program by the Ahl al-Bayt to uh, alleviate the suffering of mankind and to remove what? The plagues of racism and prejudice. These holy individuals, the study of their lives helps us today in order to recognize some trends, socio-political trends that exist. Similarly, another reason why you and I must be aware of these individuals and what they stood for is the notion of the rights and the position of women in the religion of Islam. I tell you today, as it has been for so many years, there has been many attacks by people who call the religion of Islam patriarchal, who refer to the religion of Islam as misogynistic, who quote hadith that exists and Shia literature that somehow depict females in negative light. For example, in Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, there is this na narration that is attributed to the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, and his holy progeny. The narration says, Ya ma'asharan nisa, tasaddaqna. O oh, women, make sure you give sadaqa. Wa ata'na azwajikun, and obey your husbands. Fa'inna aktharakum finnar. The majority of you are in hell. Somebody picks up this hadith and says the religion talks about equity. The religion talks about the rights of women. How is this acceptable? Then you look at Nahjul Balagha. Yes, you look at Nahjul Balagha and there is a narration in Nahjul Balagha from Amir al Mu'mineen wa Imam al Muttaqeen Ali ibn Abi Talib sallallahu wa sallam alayhi. <coughs> That states what? Al-mar'atu sharrun kulluha. Female is evil in its entirety. You think in Najul Balagha? Then you look at another narration in Najul Balagha that says females are deficient in faith, deficient in intellect. Yes? These narrations have been studied. Our ulama have presented answers. We have looked at them in other examinations and lectures. However, the purpose of referencing them today is what? Is that the study of the lives of the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt highlights and seeks to what? Make a stance against such narrations. To say, how is it possible that these holy individuals exist were praised by the Ahl al-Bayt? They have a high status in the eyes of Allah. Theologically, they're very, very important. Yet, we have such narrations. They don't go hand in hand. They cannot be somehow, what? Supported. And therefore, the biographies seek to highlight how the religion of Islam honors females because these ladies were not necessarily ma'soom, except one. One of the 13, what? Is ma'soomah. Only one of the 13 mothers of the 14 Ahl al-Bayt is what is Arab free sinless chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifically for this role. The others are considered individuals who are righteous but not necessarily have reached the degree of what? Of Asma at the same time. One of the benefits of looking at this wonderful study in which insha'Allah ta'ala in the next two weeks each and every night we will begin this journey to unravel the treasures of the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt, yes. Starting with Amina bin Tawahab tomorrow, inshallah, and ending with Narjis, the mother of the awaited savior, Al-Imam al-Mahdi al-Muntadhar, Ajjallahu ta'ala farajahu al-Sharif. Oh. <coughs> oh. 
Another beautiful fruit of this discussion is to establish the Islamic stance on the position of mothers in Islam. No doubt, you and I have heard of Majalis, have come across the narration of the Prophet of Islam, where he famously says, paradise lies under the feet of the mother. No doubt. But there is an interesting narration that I came across in this regard, that once the Prophet of Islam said to one of the companions, he says, if you're performing salah, which is recommended, and your father calls you, do not break your salah. But if your mother calls you, then respond to her and break your salah. We've all heard of the narrations that tell us how an individual came to the messenger of God and said, Ya Rasulullah, I have to look after my mother and I have to look after my father. Whom shall I what prioritize? The Prophet of Islam would say, your mother, your mother, your mother, then your father. Points to what? All this and more points to the significance and the importance that mothers have within the religion of Islam. And how you and I must appreciate this reality without a shadow of a doubt. When we look at the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt, we see how the Imams loved them, how the Imam praised them, how they had a pivotal role in their upbringing. Because today, many studies have shown the role of the womb in ensuring that what some characteristics are passed on to the child. Please focus on this final point. What do we mean when it comes to the aqidah within the school of Ahl al-Bayt? We believe that these mothers, number one, have been specifically chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you will see this emerging when we study their biographies. They were not random females chosen by the imams to be the ones carrying the ma'soom chosen by Allah. And some of the stories are fascinating. How the imam would locate them, especially later on. Yes? Secondly, we also believe that what? We also believe that they are monotheistic. They must have never worshipped anything other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? When we read ziyara, for example, warith, we re read in this ziyara, ashhadu annaka kunta nooran fil aslabil shamikha wal arhamil mutahara, isn't it? We bear witness that you're a light that passed on between the loins that were what? That were upright and the wombs that were pure. Quran comes forward and tells the Holy Prophet of Islam, وَتَقَلُّبَكَ فِي السَّاجِدِينَ Chapter 26, verse number 219. Allah Taala says that the Prophet of Islam passed through what? Individuals who were worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah only. The womb was pure. Yes. Similarly, the same thing can be said about the mothers of the Ahl al-Bayt The belief in the school of Ahl al-Bayt, our aqeedah is that these holy individuals have what? Have pure wombs in order to carry these great personalities chosen by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there is an interesting story here to, to establish this fact. At the battle of Jamal, we have Muhammad ibn Hanafiyyah who is the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen. But his mother is Khawla bint Ja'far. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya stands to fight as he was sent by Amir al-Mu'mineen. Muhammad ibn Hanafiya fought bravely. He was courageous. He was asked, why are you fighting? And Hassan and Hussein are yet to fight. He said, I am like the hands. Hassan and Hussein are like the face. It is the responsibility of the hands to protect the face. Later, he was also asked again. He replied differently. He says, I am the son of Ali. Hassan and Hussein are the sons of Muhammad. It is the responsibility of the sons of Ali to protect the sons of Muhammad. Yet in one instance, we are told, Amir al-Mu'mineen sent him to fight. He came back. Because what? He was worried. He was afraid. 
too many arrows was being shot. Amir al-Mu'mineen said to him something interesting at that moment. He said to him, Idruk arqa ummik. The reason why you came back and Hassan and Hussein did not come back is because of your mother. They're both the sons of Ali, yes. Hassan and Hussein are the sons of Ali and the sons of the Prophet. But Muhammad ibn Hanafiya was the son of Ali, but his mother was what? Khawla, yes. Amir al Mu'mineen says, The reason why you came back is because of what? Of the impact your mother has had upon you, yes. That you do not have the degree of courage that the Hassanin had in this particular way, yes. And that is why we find there is a beautiful narration from Sayyidatul Nisa Fatima al Zahra, salawatullahi wa salamu alayha. <coughs> this narration is called the narration of the white scripture, Al Lawhatul Bayda. Please understand this narration because it is narrated from Jabir ibn Abdullah al Ansari. Jabir ibn Abdullah, peace be upon him, was with the fifth holy imam who asked him to narrate this particular important hadith. Jabir says, دَخَلْتُ عَلَى مَوْلَاتِي فَاطِمَ بِنْتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ لِأُهَنِّئُهَا بِمَوْلِدِهَا الْحُسَيْنِ I went to see her to give her glad tidings after the birth of Sayyid al-Shuhada, the third holy imam. فَإِذَا بِيَدِهَا صَحِيفَةٌ بَيْضَاءٌ مِنْ دُرَّةٌ I saw in her hands a white, what? A white sheet. فَقُلْتُ لَهَا I said to her, O oh, Sayyidatul Nisa, what is this that you're holding? She said, it has the names, Fiha Asma'ul A'imma Min Wildi. It has the names of all the Imams from my sons. Yes. This is a narration that's found in the book Al-Ihtijaj of Sheikh Al-Saduq and as well as this of Uyun Akhbar Al-Ridha and a number of other scholars. Jabir says, oh lady, please, can I touch it? Can I see it? He wanted to see the names of the Imams. Sayyidatul Nisa said, no, you cannot touch it. Why? لا يمسها إلا نبي أو وصي نبي أو أهل بيت. This cannot be held except by a prophet or a vicegerent of the prophet or one who is directly from the Ahl al-Bayt. Yet, she shows it to Jabir. Jabir said, I read in it the following. I saw in it the names of all the 14 plus their mothers. فَإِذَا أَبُوا الْقَاسِمْ مُحَمَّدْ أُمُّهُ آمِنَةً أَبُوا الْحَسَنْ عَلِي أُمُّهُ فَاطِمَ بِنْتَ أَسَدْ I saw the name of each and every one of them. He then lists out the names of these holy individuals plus their mother's name. And this is an important document that has been used by our ulama as well as historians in the discussion surrounding the lives and the biographies of the mothers of the Imams. Yet, there is something for you and I to know before we enter into detail in analyzing the lives of these holy individuals. And that is what? History has been unfair when it comes to depicting women and their biographies. Today, when you look at, for example, the life of Sayyida Zainab sallallahu alayha, or you look at even Sayyida Khadija, or you look at Sayyida Ma'asuma, yes, or you look at other ladies that perhaps we've come across, you do not find as much information as you do for male members of the Ahl al-Bayt. And that has two reasons. Number one, Bani Umayyah and Bani al-Abbas did not want the fadail of the Ahl al-Bayt to be presented. Therefore, much information was fabricated or distorted or hidden. Number two, the women of the Ahl al-Bayt themselves were protected by the Ahl al-Bayt. So they were not necessarily out for historians to see them as much, to write about them as much. Therefore, what we have and what we will discuss are primarily what is being mentioned by the Ahl al-Bayt themselves, by the Imams themselves, by these holy individuals, the sons themselves. And insha'Allah ta'ala, we are able to take contemporary lessons from their lives and apply it into our own 
lives with the barakah of salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <clears throat> Each night, we will also, at the end, present two things. Spiritual tip and the fiqh mas'ala. In order to make it a nice cocktail. History, yes, a bit of spirituality and a bit of jurisprudence, fiqh, regarding the masail of the month of Ramadan and fasting. First of all, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when it comes to the spiritual reminders, the Almighty Jalla wa Ala in Surah Baqarah talk to, to, tells us about the only month in which the name is mentioned in the Quran. There is no other month mentioned other than Shahru Ramadan. Rajab, Sha'ban, Dil Qa'da, Dil Hijjah, no. Shahru Ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al-Quran. No doubt, yes. The other fact that is interesting about this month is that it is continuous ibadah for an entire month, especially during the hours of fasting. And this is a special gift and the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yet what I would like to draw your opinion or draw your attention is the following. Towards the end of the ayah, talking about the month of Ramadan, many people what, may not pay attention of the conclusion of the verse. Allah says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that you are grateful. This whole entire month of Ramadan has a purpose. One of the purposes we all discuss, yes? لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Yes? يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ السِّيَامُ كَمَا كُتِبَ عَلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّقُونَ Everyone talks about it, yet تَقْوَى 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 No doubt. But in the Quran, Allah says there is another purpose. And that is you may be grateful. Show thankfulness, gratitude to Allah. How many people tonight, or as they enter the month of Ramadan, they are excited, they are jubilant, they are jumping for joy, saying, Alhamdulillah. Sometimes people are intimidated. Sometimes they're overwhelmed. The month of Ramadan may make us worry. There are those who are worried about their coffee. Others who are worried about their cigarette. There are those who are worried about their breakfast. There are those, yes, who are worried how they're going to cope. Whereas the Quran says one of the most important areas, if you and I want to maximize benefit from the month of Ramadan, then we must eradicate all the worries, embrace it wholeheartedly with hope, optimism, positivity, and say, Alhamdulillah, shukran lillah for this great month. You and I cannot attain the maximum in the month of Ramadan without being positive, without being grateful. The Quran says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ Yes, one minute I have before the end, and that is the fiqhi reminder, and that is the following. One of the most important aspects of siyam, which many people once again neglect, unfortunately, is intention. In the idea that on a night like this, we must make an intention to fast the holy month entirely. Yes? If we do not, then we can make an intention each and every night. But the intention must be made. However, our ulama come forward and say the following. Niyyah is so important in Siyam to the extent that if you make an intention to break your fast, you have broken your fast. Without actually consuming anything during the month of Ramadan, you say, you know what? I'm going to break my fast. You haven't had any water, any food. The moment you make that niyyah, your siyam is over. This is how this particular area is so critical. That's why Sayyidatul Nisa says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made fasting obligatory so that you become sincere. It is to obtain ikhlas and sincerity, yes? It is about making that intention pure for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ask Allah wa ta'ala to grant us tawfiq, to be able to observe the month of Ramadan in the best possible way, to ensure that we attain the fruits in the best hours, the best nights, and the best moments, and we pray to him subhanahu wa ta'ala to alleviate the suffering of all mu'mineen and mu'minat around the world with the barakah of salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad.